What's good for the CBC is good for Sun News. That is the topic of tonight's byline. The CRTC announced today that Sun News Network and its French counterpart, RDI, will continue to have mandatory distribution across Canada. The ruling, technically called a 91H distribution order. How's that for bureaucraties? Well, it will have the effect that every cable or satellite subscriber in Canada will be paying for one of the two news channels from CBC. This is in addition to their taxpayer subsidy. Here at Sun News, we regard this as a positive sign. Viewers know that we applied for the same license, a 91H or mandatory carriage. We had hearings in April where some 50,000 people submitted well, they supported us via petition, while a petition opposed had similar numbers. Thousands of you wrote letters, actual letters, not emails, in support of our application to the CRTC. Now, at our hearing, we faced tough questions, as should be expected, and there was plenty of media attention from the media party folks cheering on our demise. But today's ruling should be a signal that the CRTC sees the value in making sure that Canadian news channels are available to all Canadians. Here's how Sun News VP Corey Tanaik, my boss, views the decision. Quote, we view the CRTC granting 91H status to CBC News Network and RDI as consistent with our own application for mandatory carriage. All Canadian news channels should be made available in all Canadian households. So today, despite statements or claims that mandatory carriage is outdated and a relic from the past, the CRTC has said this kind of license remains valuable to Canada's broadcast landscape. I hope they mean it. And I hope they mean it for more than just the state broadcaster. For the CRTC to grant this license to CBC, but to deny it to Sun News, would call the impartiality of the broadcast regulator into question. Canada needs multiple voices when it comes to news, current affairs, and opinion programming. We stated from the beginning that our preference would be a free market, but we don't have one in Canada, so we're playing by the rules set out by the broadcast regulator. I would hope, and you should too, that to, well, today's decision is not a one-off favor from one part of the government broadcast apparatus to another. Already, we've seen troubling news regarding CBC and the current government, news that we brought you last night. A tepid attempt to bring in accountability is being fought by the Harper government, which seems to want to continue giving special treatment to CBC. We hope that today's ruling from the CRTC is not another favor, but rather a precedent that will be followed. And that's the byline. I think the amendments are reasonable and uh, the, the matter is going before a committee and um, I've got confidence that the committee will deal with it. All right, while I'm saying that the CRTC made the right decision in regards to their CBC application, I, I'm not bearing the hatchet with the state broadcaster. And right there, you just heard from Justice Minister Rob Nicholson uh, defending the idea that he's going to gut a bill we've told you about before. It's one we talked about last night. It is from Conservative MP Brent Rathgeber, and he joins us now from Parliament Hill. And, and Brent, we described your bill last night as it's kind of having two parts. One is about CBC accountability. The other part is about the general public service and accountability. And your worry from my reading your blog is that they want to gut both sides of this. Explain how they're going to gut the, the CBC side uh, uh, of the bill in opening up accountability. Well, with respect to the CBC side, um, CBC has been lobbying and it seems successfully so with respect to journalistic source privilege. Uh, currently, the 68.1 of the Access Act, a much maligned 68.1, created sort of a general exclusion for CBC with regard to journalistic programming and competitive information. Um, you know about the, the litigation. Uh, yeah, this is the one, and we can show people uh, some of the things they've turned down, claiming it related to their programming and journalistic sources. They said we couldn't find out how many trucks they owned or leased. It took us years to get that. Uh, the things on employee morale surveys, all of that. Even just today, I got one back. It was on uh, their website hosting. They, sure. oh, no, no, you can't have that. So That's my, not a journalistic source. Yeah, so I'm my, sorry. So my bill repeals the 68.1 exclusion and replaces it with uh, what the information commissioner has described as a discretionary exemption. So that if uh, there's a matter under review, if the CBC can demonstrate that they're somehow being prejudiced by the disclosure, that their independence as a public broadcaster is somehow being compromised, then she will recommend against disclosure. But CBC, right. CBC successfully lobbied, it appears, that uh, they're going to get an exclusion with respect to journalists 
journalistic sources. And I'm not, I'm not conceptually opposed to CBC being able to protect their, their journalistic source privilege, but I think all decisions of CBC ought to be reviewable by the Information Commissioner. And if, uh, they do in fact, if they do in fact get an exclusion, then those decisions will be off limits from Information Office uh, review. Look, I, I, uh, I believe in protecting journalistic sources as well. Unfortunately, CBC has abused it to a, a ridiculous degree over the years. Uh, to, to put it in plain language, what your bill would do is say, look, if they don't want to release it, it's up to the information commissioner, who is an officer of parliament. They don't work for me. They work for parliament. That, that person would make a decision on whether it fell within the parameters of protecting journalistic sources or, or other materials, right? It, it that, would, that's essentially what it comes down to. Yes. All yes. right. And it, and it requires the corporate CBC to demonstrate why the document should not be released. Okay. So the government says, uh, the justice minister, the government that you're, uh, well, you're, you're in the same party as the government. They want to take that away and give a, a complete exclusion. So that's... To me, that's uh, going in the wrong direction, especially after the court fights that happened and, and the fact that the information commissioner herself, uh, Suzanne Legault, she's, she supports your bill, doesn't she? Yeah, she's going to be testifying tomorrow. And in fact, the discretionary exemption was very much her idea. It was, it was the, from her testimony when uh, the parliamentary committee did a review on 68.1 a little over a year ago that I got the idea for, uh, for uh, repealing 68.1 and replacing it with a discretionary exemption. All right, I don't want to shift gears to the uh, the other side because your bill would bring a lot of, um, in my view, much needed uh, accountability, transparency to what we pay our top civil servants. These are people that are paid huge salaries. And if we can show people the example, uh, your bill would open everything up from $188,600 and up. You would be on a sunshine list. The Justice Minister's proposal says, no, no, we'll give a range, but only a range for the top bureaucrats. If you're in the top pay bracket, then we'll show you that the person makes somewhere in there. Why isn't that good enough? Well, the current legislation, the current Access Act, currently allows ranges. My bill would allow for specific disclosure above 188. Uh, what I understand the Justice Department wants to do is they want to raise the benchmark from specific salary disclosure from 188 to uh, 329. And to me, that's a ridiculous number. That's going to um, exclude 98 and possibly 99 percent of the, of the federal public service and that's not meaningful disclosure and the ranges that are currently available are not meaningful disclosure because they're so incrementally large you see ranges like 272 to 319 well that's over sixty thousand dollars which is well above the average Canadian's entire salary so that being the incremental yeah. range is not meaningful disclosure and taxpayers deserve better okay so this bill is in in my view from the, the what I've received back in terms of email, Facebook posts, other correspondence. This is something that is popular with the base supporters of your party. So what's going on here? They, to me, this seems like an internal civil war, and I don't want to blow it too much out of proportion. I don't think you and Justice Minister Nicholson are, 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 are duking it out uh, in, in the back rooms, but why would the Justice Minister and Cabinet be looking at uh, changing something that's popular with your party supporters. Well, I, I think there has been some backroom negotiations. Uh, uh, interestingly, the disclosure benchmark w w has gone from DM1 in my bill, the lowest level of deputy minister, to outside the highest level of deputy minister, DM4. So it, it's the, it appears to me that it's the deputy ministers, the mandarins, who have uh, had the ear of their ministers and somehow convinced the government, convinced the cabinet yeah. that the, got, the benchmark should, have been, that should be raised. We've got uh, sunshine lists in Saskatchewan, in Manitoba, in Ontario. It's anything above a. Uh, uh, Hundred thousand. I can find out what my boss makes, the the, the head of Quebec Corps, because it's a publicly traded company. They have to expose that that sort of thing. Why should uh, top civil servants be any different? Well, they shouldn't be, and you're quite right. The trend is going in favor of greater disclosure and more transparency. And sadly, in my view, the government is resisting that trend. All right, Brent. It's good talking to you, and uh, keep up the fight. Good luck with the bill. Thanks, Brian.